We're gonna get started in a minute and we are live streaming. So if you could have a seat so that uh, we can get going at two o'clock. So we've got a full agenda. All right, well, welcome. I'm Kim Fikoski. I'm the project manager with the South Florida Water Management District for the C43 Reservoir Water Quality Feasibility Study. And this is the second of four public meetings. I'd like to kick off the meeting with uh, Commissioner Mitch Wills, and he's going to do some opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get some... Uh, some new, uh, new language of what's going on outside of town. If you haven't visited the facility, it's pretty amazing. You have the opportunity to tour it twice, and it's pretty fascinating. So uh, if you have questions today, I'm sure they've got several panels up here. They'll be able to answer just about anything you have. Again, welcome to Henry County for those of you that are not from here. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. Hope you all had safe travels, and I'm going to turn over to Richard Bartlett. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm excited to kick off this second meeting. Uh, it's, uh, I know that right after Governor DeSantis took office, he basically gave us direction at the Water Management District and at Department of Environmental Protection to, uh, hey, let's figure out how to address water quality when it came to the C-43 Reservoir. And uh, we jumped right on it, uh, formed this fabulous team of folks to really help us guide through this effort, help us engage the public uh, look at all the options and review all the options. Um, and so we want to have a good discussion here today. Uh, engage if, when you can uh, and certainly talk to this team whenever you feel you need to about, you know, opportunities to address water quality because it's so important to the folks of this community and to the Water Management District, DEP, and all the local governments here. I want to introduce Chauncey Goss. He probably doesn't need introduction. He's my boss, uh, chairman at the South Florida Water Management District. and. Uh, obviously he comes from Sanibel and it's uh, the uh, quality entering the Cluesatchee estuary couldn't be more important to that community. Uh, so, uh, you know, his participation is not unexpected at all. So anyway, I want to turn it back over to Kim uh, to do introductions and, and get on with this agenda. But thanks everyone for coming and I look forward to a good discussion. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. As Drew stated, um, when when the governor decided to that this was a priority for water quality improvement in Southwest Florida, we formed uh, we met DEP and the Water Management District met with the City of Sanibel and Lee County and talked about how can we get local uh, stakeholder input and collaborate on this study. So I'd like to with that after that meeting, the result was the formation of this working group. So I'd like for them to each come up. Uh, we are live streaming, so I'd like for them each to come up to the podium and just identify themselves so you know who your local resources are for questions, comments, concerns. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maya Robert. I'm the environmental resource manager. Um, at the city of Cape Coral Public Works. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to be part of this uh, effort and to be of help of the public. So um, please reach out uh, if anybody has questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shane Parker. I'm the county engineer and public works director for Hendry County. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Smith. I'm the director of the Office of Water Management and Everglades Restoration with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm actually located in Tallahassee normally, but I have staff in Fort Myers, uh, Alyssa Freitag, or Gil Hooley, excuse me. Uh, if so, if you have questions locally, she's here to answer your questions. Otherwise, I'm here to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm James Evans. I'm the Director of Natural Resources for the City of Sanibel. I know at least one of our elected officials, uh, Councilwoman Holly Smith, will be here later on today. She's on her way. Um, but we really appreciate the uh, governor's bold initiatives to get you know, the water quality in the Coosahatchee and our coastal waters, um, as well as our inland waters, uh, improved for all of us. And uh, we look forward to working with you on the working group. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roland Adelini. I'm the director of Lee County's Division of Natural Resources. I'm here on behalf of our board, of Lee County Commissioners, and uh, looking forward to working with you all and the agencies involved to uh, look for these regional solutions for water quality in our area. Thank you. And Mike Cook with Lehigh Acres uh, Municipal Services Improvement District couldn't be with us today, but he's also a part of our working group. The working group's role is to assist our consulting team with locating studies, data, uh, innovative water quality strategies for their evaluation for the, uh, the feasibility portion of, of this project. Um, they are also, um, they're also here as your resource, as I said earlier. If, if as we, you hear presentations today and you look on our working group website, which I'll talk more about later. If you see any missing studies that you've done in your, your um, uh, municipalities or counties, um, you're gonna have a website that you can uh, submit to, or, and you will um, also have your working group folks that you can talk to uh, about those, those studies. Um, our working group is here for questions in addition to our, our consultants uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, and so I encourage you to engage with them. Next, I would like, next I'd like to introduce our consultant team, uh, JTEC, which is a joint venture between Jacobs Engineering and TetraTech and Wetland Solutions. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon, I'm Georgia Vince with TetraTech side of the JTEC joint venture and I'm the project manager on this project. Hello, I'm Jim Bays with uh, Jacobs Engineering, part of the JTEC team. I'm a technology uh, specialist in natural systems and working on the uh, conventional technology approach. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Keller with Wetland Solutions and I'll be working on the natural treatment systems uh, projects that will be evaluated as part of the feasibility study. Good afternoon, I'm Sean Waldeck. I'm uh, the J, the Jacobs engineering representative. I'm the site manager for the C-43 reservoir construction project. All right, thank you. As you can see, we've got a, a gr group of people working on this study. Oh, sorry about that, technically challenged. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the goals of this meeting today are to provide you an update on the literature search that we've done today to, again, solicit from you if, if there's any studies or information missing um, that you can bring it to our attention, uh, to also ensure that you understand the, the study process and the constraints that we have with this study, um, as well as to answer your questions. Um, we'll have a, a Q&A at the end of the meeting. In our first meeting, we did a one-on-one -on -one face to face. We set aside time for that. In this meeting, you should have uh, gotten some index cards as you came in. If not, there's some uh, by Jennifer Hecker there at the end of the table in the back. Um, fill out those cards as we go through the presentation if you have any questions, comments, or concerns so we can address them uh, later on in the meeting. Uh, with that, I am going to turn over the meeting to Ed Smith, and he's gonna talk about kind of the big picture, the background of the study. Thank you, Kim. So before we get started, I kind of thought it'd be a good idea to talk a little bit of background, talk about how we got to where we are today. And so, let's Okay, so this is a pretty commonly displayed uh, 
graphic for a lot of these Everglades and related uh, presentations. On the left, you have the historic flow. This is how the water once moved from the Kissimmee basins all the way down into Lake Okeechobee. And as the lake filled up, it would gradually overflow the southern shores and then begin that long trek through the Everglades and then down into eventually getting into Florida Bay. Over time, in the need for development to make it a little more habitable here in Florida, there were approximately 2,000 miles of canals entered in to drain the area to make it possible for us to live down here. Uh, but the downside to that is we have overdrained the Everglades. So along comes SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, which gets us to the future flow where we reduce those east and west discharges dramatically and eventually get to where that water is moving back to where it once came or once went into the Florida Bay area. So the C-43 is a big component of that and in the executive order that was issued by the governor on uh, January 10th, 2019 highlighted that there needed to be something done about the C-43 uh, C reservoir or, or Western Storage Basin uh, Reservoir. It was kind of recognized that this reservoir didn't have a treatment associated with it and there was a possibility, a, a, a good possibility that it could become a source of harmful algal blooms. Uh, you get water in it, it sits in there, it's stored in it during the, the wet season, and then during the dry season it's metered out to meet the MFL or to help with the salinity issues in the Calusa Hatchie estuary, but in doing so it allows those algal blooms to, to, to grow. And so he recognized that we needed to have better protection of our environment and our water quality in the state of Florida. He developed the or directed the development of the Blue Green Algae Task Force, which is come to fruition and already met and made several wonderful recommendations that DEP is running with right now, um, including the innovative technology grants. Those have been issued and we're starting the process to get those projects underway. And then finally is to provide that additional treatment of the stormwater associated with the C-43 reservoir to make sure that whatever's leaving that reservoir is cleaner than what's coming in. So again, this is how DEP is leading it, and this is all from this, the uh, executive order issued by Governor DeSantis. We've established the Harmful uh, Algal Bloom or Red Tide Task Force, and uh, my, my understanding is that on the 23rd of this month, they're meeting for the third time, and at that meeting, they will finalize their uh, Carinia Brevia or Red Tide recommendations and needs assessment. Uh, they've got another meeting coming up soon after that. It's a full meeting. Uh, don't know the date on that offhand, but it's coming up. The Blue Green Algae Task Force, again, they've made their, rec their first round of recommendations. They're about to start to kick off that next round of recommendations. Uh, the agricultural BMPs, we're working, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is working with South Florida Water Management District and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to kind of reevaluate those and, and uh, see where we can make improvements. And then uh, the feasibility study group here we've been meeting for about a year now almost a year and I think we're making great progress and looks like we're gonna have a, a, a good meeting today and hopefully we'll come up with some good solutions and then finally one of the key focuses of this group is the technology library that's housed within the Florida Department of Environmental Protection it's one where we have reviewed technologies as they come in over the over the over the history over time since going back to the 90s uh, and this, this team is going to take those that have been there along with other recommendations and kind of evaluate to see where we can go to come up with the right project or projects to help with the C-43 water quality. All right. All right, so as far as this particular study, um, we're going to be identifying opportunities to provide additional water quality treatment and uh, improve the water quality leaving the C-43 reservoir. Um, that's the primary objective of this project. And we'll be evaluating different treatment options. And the goal is at the end of the study to have three alternatives identified for future development. Um, we're gonna be evaluating um, pre-treatment, uh, pre-storage op opportunities. So treating the water before it goes into the reservoir 
treating the water in the reservoir, as well as post-storage uh, post treatment oppor opportunities. And um, we want to ensure that these technologies are cost-effective and technically feasible. And um, um, let's see. We're going to be considering biological, chemical, and physical water quality treatment technologies. And we want to make sure that they're scalable and available for long-term use. Um, finally, we have to ensure that any treatment technology that is chosen is compatible with the objectives of the reservoir. So um, this is our project schedule. We have our second public meeting today. Our feasibility study is under development. We're currently collecting uh, information about treatment technologies. Uh, we're creating our um, information collection summary report, which is due to be finalized in March. And then we'll go on to the next phase of the project, which is evaluating the technologies that were identified in the data collection summary. The study is supposed to be wrapping up um, in October, and the final meeting will be in November of 2020. And I'll hand it over to Sean to talk about the reservoir itself. Thanks, Georgia. I'm going to speak loud because we're competing with the soda machine over here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the construction manager, or the site manager for the construction of the C43 reservoir uh, project itself. And as uh, Ed mentioned, um, the the premise of the project is very simple. It's basically a large surge tank that we're building out there, just about uh, six miles west of us right now, is to capture any excess runoff from the basin itself, as well as Lake Okeechobee releases, and try to, to, to improve the quality or the, quanti the quality and timing and distribution of those flows um, coming down the Caloosahatchee River uh, so that we can make the, uh, or manage the salinity barrier within the Caloosahatchee River and estuary. Um, and also uh, maintain water supply for existing legal users. <clears throat> Again, as Ed mentioned, the project is a component of SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration uh, pr Plan, and the project implementation report, uh, which initiated the design for the project, was, a, was approved in 2010 and authorized by Congress in 2014. A uh, partnership agreement with the Corps of Engineers was uh, executed in June of 2016, and this project is a 50-50 cost share with the Corps of Engineers. So the Corps of Engineers is actually on site with me um, as we execute the construction of the project. <clears throat> For operations, very simply, the reservoir is located about halfway between the Franklin Lock on the Caloosahatchee River to our west and the Ortona Lock to our east. And we direct flows from the river down what's called the Townsend Canal and into the reservoir. As we'll mention a little later, we monitor the flows at the Franklin Lock in order to determine water coming in and going out of the reservoir once the project's completed and in operation. So for water to get into the reservoir, it comes through the from the river, flows south down the Townsend Canal about a mile or so, and through a large pump station. If anybody's been out to the site on the site tour, we're currently constructing the S-470 pump station. That's a 1500 CFS uh, inflow pump station uh, ultimately designed to bring water into the reservoir. The reservoir is broken into two cells, or will be constructed in two cells, roughly half and half. There'll be a structure that allows water to transfer from one cell to the other. And then for discharge, there's two discharge structures located on the north side of the reservoir that will direct flows when the river calls for it, essentially, out of the reservoir, back into the Townsend Canal, and back into the Caloosahatchee River. So, from an operational standpoint, some of our constraints or some of our challenges, as we like to call them, is that the, the, 
the reservoir discharges, the intake and discharges are based on flow available in the system. Basically what's coming down the river from Lake Okeechobee or in the basin and what the estuary natural system is calling for. So we'll operate the reservoir to store any excess water that we get in the rainy season. That's when we generally will fill and then we'll discharge in the dry season um, to help modulate that salinity barrier in the estuary. And again, all of those uh, intakes and discharge are governed by flow that's measured at the Franklin Lock. Uh, the Corps of Engineers calls that S79. So we fill in the wet season, we discharge in the dry season. We can uh, typically discharge on a on a usual uh, MFL basis, about 450 CFS, plus or minus. We have the ca capacity to take a 1500 CFS, so we get a big hurricane, big storm event, we can take a whole bunch of water at one time. Um, and in emergency discharges, we have the ability to discharge 2500 CFS. Thanks, so just a couple more notes as we move forward before we get to the um information about the treatment technologies that we've evaluated to date and um, wetland treatment systems. We have some constraints associated with our study. Um, first and foremost, we cannot affect the congressionally approved the C43 reservoir project, the purpose, the benefits, the infrastructure, or the construction schedule or operation. So that's already set and approved and whatever we uh, evaluate and come up with at the end of our study period cannot affect uh, the reservoir project. Um, we don't have specific project lands identified for um, where these treatment technologies will be placed on the ground, so um, that will be in a later phase. So at this current time, we're just looking, we're um, evaluating technologies independent of land availability. And um, we are focusing on studies that are in the DEP library of water issues um, that um, Ed Smith briefly spoke about that um, database is available online. We are not exclusively looking at those technologies. We will consider other technologies that we that are provided to if information is provided to us. Um, and um, one of the things we have to keep in mind as we move forward that this reservoir and the treatment components are not intended to achieve compliance with the TMDLs, but hopefully we make progress towards those. Uh, water quality standards. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Jim Bays, who's going to be talking about the treatment technology database and technology we've um, reviewed to date. All right, thank, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I'm gonna, Chris and I are going to present an overview of the different types of treatment technologies that we're looking at um, and a little more background on them. I'll start off with a general description of uh, what our needs are, what the conceptual application would be here. Uh, we've mentioned several times the DEP's uh, accepted technology uh, and innovative technology uh, list. We'll go through the ones we've looked at and uh, summarize those. Uh, other technologies that have come to us through uh, unsolicited submittals and uh, things we know from the business, so uh, we're, and if, uh, we fully expect to see more of those come in, but we're trying to collect everything we can on this. Then an overview of what we mean by physical, chemical, or biological treatment and how it applies here. So the first question for us is, uh, what are we trying to treat? And what we're saying, obviously, here is nitrogen, because of its importance to the estuary and its importance on algal uh, bloom formation, is a key component. We're looking for technologies that assist us with that treatment but also phosphorus removal, that of course is the limiting nutrient for algal growth uh, in the freshwater systems. And we have a, a huge reservoir that we're going to fill with water from the river. So technologies that help us in either of those nutrients are the way to go. Uh, suspended solids in the form of algal particles or suspended matter from the river itself are also uh, of interest to us. Uh, they, uh, they include with them nutrients that we're trying to control. So collectively, technologies that can cover all of these areas are what we are want to look at. So the next question is how to treat that. So we have really looked at a full spectrum here of technology approaches 
using natural systems like treatment wetlands, like the STAs uh, that the district uses for treatment of phosphorus for the Everglades runoff, but also conventional treatment technologies like physical uh, filtration, chemical coagulation, biological remediation. These are all uh, of, the, of interest to us because that's the technology uh, library, if you will, these days. But they all have their draws, uh, their, their, their pluses and minuses. Uh, natural systems rely upon natural processes, uh, natural energies to accomplish the treatment. Uh, they usually require extensive land area because of its, uh, those inputs. A chemical and conventional treatments uh, require tanks, uh, power, uh, electricity, uh, chemicals. All these things have a cost and a, uh, a maintenance requirement attached to them. But a far less land is typically required to implement these types of systems. So there's a trade-off both in the operations and the land requirements to use these approaches. So the third question is, where would we treat? And so as we've mentioned, there's really three phases of operation here. There's the filling stage, where the water is drawn from the canal. Uh, the storage phase, when the water resi resides in the reservoir. And the drainage, discharge stage, where it's flowing back to the river. Uh, each of those prevents oppor presents opportunities for treatment. Obviously, if we can remove nutrients before it enters the reservoir, we might not encounter algal bloom development in that system and have a cleaner water coming out. If we are cleaning water in the reservoir, we've already captured it. Maybe there's a benefit to just processing it in place. Finally, for the discharge, we're heading back to the river, and like Ed said, that's our primary goal, to make sure the water discharging is better quality than what it was when we drew it in. Drew it in. So that's an extra opportunity for treatment. One of the uh, advantages of that second op set third stage of operation is that the flow ranges that we're trying to treat might be substantially less than during the loading phase. And we've got several months to spread that flow out over the course of a year. So in terms of uh, the general uh, suite of technologies in physical treatment, we are using kind of a general uh, category of uh, filtration where we're passing water through a media for separation of particles or other matter from the water itself. Um, Think of sand filters, think of membrane filters. Uh, for sorption, we're looking to capture the pollutant by sorbing it or binding it chemically uh, to a, a, a sorptive material and then remove that material. Uh, dissolved air flotation takes advantage of the fact that algae or other particles already contain a lot of the nutrients that we're trying to remove. And by using a fine bubble diffuser, we can float those off and create a clear permeate and, a, and manage the sludge separately from that. And that can be enhanced with chemical application. Oxidation, we can actually add an electric spark to the water, if you will, and burn, oxidize that material before it uh, in the water itself. Uh, sonication is when you apply like an ultrasonic uh, wavelength to uh, disrupt algal cells and, and uh, distort or damage the uh, algal cells' ability to grow. These are all physical methods here of treatment. So what, we, what I've done is I've kind of picked a couple of examples just for interest sake and just to give an example of what we're looking at out of the library of technologies that the DEP has assembled uh, to use to help to illustrate the point. Uh, the first one here is uh, a physical and chemical combination from the innovative technology list. It's by a company called Aquafiber. They also have a suite called Aqualutions. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture here of a facility they built up in Florida already uh, to, to as a pilot project for the St. John's River Water Management District to treat water uh, in Lake Jessup. And there's a method of removing phosphorus by using dissolved air flotation amended by a chemical addition to separate out those algal solids and remove the phosphorus and nitrogen attached to that. So that's a system that ran for five years and it published a very detailed report. And I'm highlighting this example because as we combine our way, as we comb our way through all these different technologies, we're encountering a wide range of quality of, and depth of information available. Um, there, it's, it's amazing what the innovation has been and what the imaginations of people have been to generate these approaches, but the quality and the ability to evaluate their technologies varies extensively. So I'm mentioning this one as one that's relatively well documented and uh, it provides useful information. What's important here is that they've been able to show very extensive and very uh, 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 significant removal of phosphorus and nitrogen, solids, all the things that we want and maintain a saturated, uh, uh, well oxygenated water coming out. Because they've built a system and they've had flows attached to that, we can derive scalability factors from that, scaling factors that let us estimate what it might cost or what the size might be for a full scale system. 
We also know something about the operation and maintenance requirements, uh, making sure there's power to move air for the dissolved air flotation, power to move the water from some unit process to unit process, the cost for the chemicals attached to that. So out of this example, we're able to derive some information that's very useful for assessing it for the full scale system. Just an example. For chemical treatment, the process there is to add a charged chemical, like an aluminum compound, for example, to the water to neutralize the naturally neutral, the naturally negatively charged particles uh, in the water itself. What we want to do is neutralize those naturally uh, negative charges to organic particles such as algae or suspended matter or colloidal materials and allow them to stick together uh, with the addition of other compounds such as flocculants. We're essentially trying to enhance that, that settling process. So this is the case where we're trying to overcome the natural tendency of particles to kind of resist each other and bounce around and try to turn them into larger particles, separate out those by gravity or some other method of separation. Uh, one technology that does that is electrocoagulation. This is on the DEP innovative technology list. Uh, it's been, as a technology, been in application for over 20 years. There are very few full-scale uh, applications, but there are uh, several demonstrations and examples that are out there. One company in Florida we've been talking to has tested this uh, both in, the, in various basins, and Lake Jessup is one, and other parts of the state. But the idea here is that electric current is applied to the water. It, it flows between two anodes. That releases both electrons in the water as well as the metal ions to provide the same function that the chemical coagulants have done. Basically, we're neutralizing the charge on the particles and attaching a metal ion to that for settling and, uh, and uh, removal from the water. We know from these demonstration projects what some flows have been, what the power requirements are. We can use that information going forward to extrapolate to a full-scale system. Uh, finally, for the biological treatment, we have two broad categories. Bioremediation, where we're adding in a competing microbe, and that, or maybe a suite of microbes, to compete with algae for nutrients, and or actually, or to digest or to attack the, the algae, and or uh, put the algae through, put the water through a media populated by these microbes. And that allows a co competitive interaction to take place, and the, and the algae to lose, and the bacteria to win, essentially. But this requires adding in these uh, uh, microbes, and that typically is a mixture of uh, both the uh, uh, inoculant itself, as well as the material to make it stick together, and as well as the, uh, the fuel, the, the food for those uh, microorganisms. Uh, another approach is to use floating wetland islands, so essentially constructed wetlands that float on buoyant uh, matrices or using treatment wetlands. And Chris will cover that in his section on natural treatment. And so uh, one of these examples of a biological process drawn from the DEP innovative technology list is the BioCleaner. And this is a 10 foot long uh, uh, suspended floating um, a device in a, in a reservoir or lake where it's aerated, air is pumped through it, air is pumped through a media tube which is inoculated with bacteria. And the, as the water is drawn into that media tube, it comes in contact with this media, the bacteria uh, take up the nutrients, they compete with the algae, and the water that's re released has a re significant reduction in oxygen demand and other compounds. Uh, this is a, a relatively small scale thing. It's 10, meter, 10 feet long. It is, as a system to treat a, a, a 10,000 acre reservoir, it, it suggests that there's going to be some challenges here with scaling up on that. But it is part of the mix of technologies we're reviewing at, and we're in, uh, looking at all these uh, technologies uh, with an even, uh, even approach. So our data collection report will uh, summarize what we know about these technologies, plus others that have come in. I'll mention a few in a minute here. Uh, and basically create a, a starting point for the evaluation process for uh, uh, developing the matrix and uh, uh, coming up with the final selection criteria. Uh, so this is where public input comes into play, these type of meetings we're having today. Uh, things that you hear that are interesting or that you like or you suggest, or if you have a technology that you're a representative of, that's the kind of information that still is timely for us to consider. So just stepping back a little bit now to look at the DEP uh, technology status, uh, technology uh, library, if you will. There's 30 that are now on the state's uh, list of accepted technologies. 15 of these are what we would call physical. They're either using sedimentation or uh, filtration in some form. Seven are chemical, eight are biological. We have information on 27 of those. Three of those don't really, of those companies or suppliers don't seem to be responding to our request for information, but that's a small part of that, and we can, we can work with that. We also have received other unsolicited submittals from other companies. 
Uh, and we also have other uh, approaches that we've brought in from other projects. Five of those are physical, two are chemical, and one's biological. So at a, as, a, as a potential range of choices, there's a lot to work with here. And there's a lot to sort through and try to standardize into a way of comparison that's useful to the district and the, and the community. Uh, so just a real quick glance at what these technologies are. Here's the list of DEP accepted physical technologies broken down by uh, sedimentation and filtration, or uh, uh, which largely is derived from the, uh, the marketplace of the urban stormwater treatment. A, a lot of these are basically hydrodynamic separators, solid separators that uh, keep out uh, stormwater solids from the receiving water bodies and are very standard uh, approaches for uh, uh, common approaches to urban stormwater management. Uh, others are filters. Uh, uh, increasingly, we're seeing sorptive materials uh, where uh, water has to flow through a media bed and the phosphorus or nitrogen is sorbed to specific particles. Uh, there are several, uh, several uh, vendors for that approach and uh, we've we just received another one this morning. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, dissolved air flotation, uh, oxidation, uh, aeration systems. So there's really a quite, quite a range of physical approaches there. Um, the the uh, chemical approaches are more or less a list of chemical coagulants that have been on the market for a while. They're used by uh, wastewater plants all the time, surface water plants, water treatment plants for removal of particles. I in a way, a lot of the process that people use when they treat surface water for drinking water is a lot of what we'd be looking at for a physical chemical method for treatment of water uh, for this application. Uh, and also mentioned the electrocoagulation. That's on the list as well. Uh, for bioremediation, we've got, uh, for biological systems, we've got bioremediation, a handful of them. These are the kind of uh, uh, applications that you might see on uh, small ponds, neighborhood ponds or lakes. Uh, uh, nothing really pops up as having been similarly applied to a, like I say, a 10,000 acre reservoir, but there's uh, very large, uh, uh, very large examples in the project history. And we're looking at all those. And also the floating wetland islands. So this is just a real, quick thumbnail sketch of what those different technologies are. Uh, many of these, not all of them, uh, have uh, examples that have been built or demonstrated in Florida already. Uh, a Florida case studies matter a lot to us. We want these things to be uh, things that we know about, either we can visit or, or talk to, talk about, or know that it's dealing with the climate of Florida and the kind of strong seasonality that we have here in water and rainfall. Uh, some of the unsolicited submittals included uh, some conversations with uh, vendors and they say, you know what we sell, you guys might not, might not work well for you, but we've got this other thing that we're working with. And one of those came in with this first one, this uh, side bank filter, where the berm uh, of itself of a pond actually is, uh, is, is porous. It's able to filter water through there and into a, through a sorptive media layer for final polishing. So if you can imagine a basin that, is, that essentially leaks out the side and into a receiving water uh, uh, a collector that has to pass through a media bed for treatment. Then you have the combination of the, the, the storage itself providing treatment. And in this case here, we'd, we can't affect, as you've heard already, the reservoirs that the reservoir that's being built can't touch those walls or basins, but a, a separate system could be built that could store water for treatment and or polishing through this kind of system. So the salience, the working part of that is that it's the uh, sorptive material. The, in this case, it's a bold and gold, which is a product made in Florida used uh, for stormwater treatment. Um, and it's a, uh, does, a, does a good job of phosphorus removal. It's just that that is one example that has come to us uh, since we started this project. Another one is, a, is an aeration system using a fine bubble diffuser to uh, supersaturate or oxygenate uh, reservoir or lakes themselves. And this is uh, something to consider because of the nature of, I said earlier, we have all this water stored. Can we do something with it while it's being stored? So that kind of gets to this final category of, of technologies. What I was saying earlier is speaks to treating it going into the reservoir or perhaps treating it coming out, possibly also being used to recirculate water within the reservoir through a treatment process, like I've said. But generally speaking, you know, the art of management of uh, reservoirs or lakes typically includes things like aeration, or adding air to help destratify the lake and make sure it's well mixed, uh, not prone to algae uh, bloom development or uh, adding chemicals to retard the growth of algae or uh, stop their growth completely. These are common approaches. So we can consider them too, even though we've got a big reservoir here. Uh, so chemical dosing with uh, alum or other nutrient inactivating compounds is a possibility here. And uh, 
And then there's the whole like, idea of using the reservoir itself. It's a big ecosystem. It'll, retar it'll retain sediments. It'll retain nutrients and phosphorus over time. It has different zones of ox well oxygenated surface layer or, or uh, low oxygen bottom layers. And those are all both, they all have their potential applications for treatment and removal. So just as a quick overview, the idea of uh, aeration is that we're uh, injecting air into the lake itself. Um, this is deep enough that uh, we can get a lot of improvement in that water quality by just adding air, injecting it to the bottom through uh, weighted or ballasted diffusers in the bottom of the system. They don't have to be uh, built into the system necessarily. Uh, and this helps to, to stir up the algae, stir up the water column and prevent, uh, minimize the growth of algae uh, as, a, as it, it makes it difficult for the algae to get to a certain population because they're constantly being drawn down back into the lower layers of the reservoir where there's less, less oxygen, less light. Uh, add, add, adding aluminum to help com, co coalesce and coagulate and then flocculate these uh, uh, nutrients is another potential approach. Um, uh, one, uh, one method is to decrease the algae population by adding uh, uh, an ultrasonic wavelength to disrupt the algal cells and their growth potential. Uh, this has been done. It's typically done in very small systems, but it's a technology that's out there. Or adding an algicide uh, to control the algae itself. Uh, as a hotspot approach, uh, this is actually a common uh, lake management technique. But to the question of using the reservoir itself for treatment, that's something that's very interesting, obviously, and it, seems it potentially has a, another treat while being stored kind of concept to it. But the idea here is that the lake, when it's full, will likely stratify. There'll be a up, warmer upper layer and a colder bottom layer. And that means it'll have more oxygen at the top than at the bottom, typically, is what we see. If there's a way to actually recirculate the water and bring some of that oxygenated surface water with some of the uh, oxygenated uh, nitrogen compounds back down into the subsurface, into the hypolimnion, there's a potential there to remove some of that nitrogen that's accumulating and form nitrogen gas that would not be prone to uh, in encouraging algae populations. So uh, those are just the, that's the suite of things we're looking at, the physical, chemical, biological, things we've asked for, things that have come in the door, uh, things we know about. The big question is how do we organize that information and how we're going to be looking at that. So I've taken an example here from our matrix that we're developing where we go line by line through each one of these technologies and uh, you know, put their name out there, describe what kind of what it is. With. So I'm using our three examples here, aquafiber, uh, the, the electric coagulation system, and the, uh, uh, the biocleaner. Uh, whether it's a physical, chemical, or biological process, is there a Florida case history? Yes, in this case. Uh, what kind of concentrations have they been known to treat? We're looking for systems that have been treating in our range, which is a couple milligrams of nitrogen and a, about, a, two to about 0.2 milligrams per liter phosphorus in that range. And so we see that uh, the uh, aquifiber and Powell water systems, electric coagulation in this case, have actually treated to those levels. Um, what are those concentration reductions? Typically very high. Uh, what have been the area requirements for the specific examples they provided to us? That's useful because then we can attach that to the flow values and come up with a scaling factor for our flows that we're looking to treat. And then finally, you know, what, what kind of power requirements do they, do they need? Uh, you know, what is it, they all need some kind of power. What does that cost? Um, what is that, how much is it and what does it cost? Then uh, the big question always with these technologies is what to do with the residuals, with the waste product of this treatment process. That is, we we'll typically amass a pretty large um, uh, amount of solids uh, during this treatment process. The solids might be largely biological, uh, algae particles or suspended material, but they'll have chemical constituents uh, that are comprised of the, of the material used to coagulate and settle the material. Um, so how, do they, how, do, how are these particular examples managing those residuals? And sometimes they store them, sometimes they repurpose them, make them uh, something. Sometimes they use them as a soil additive or as a uh, soil filler, soil amendment. And finally, we're, we're going to get to some level of cost. And so the examples that are being provided have often, often include some previous, some pr previous uh, extrapolation of what these things cost to build. You know, the idea of a, uh, of a full scale aqua, uh, you know, aqua fiber system. Uh, they were looking at a 20 MGD application, and that would have cost $20 million just to build that. And, and, uh, maybe about you know, a, a dollar per thousand gallons to operate. Those are the kind of numbers, frankly, that wouldn't surprise me down the road for a system like this on a physical treatment side. They all have that kind of information. 
And rather than pick one out and say, well, this is it so far, we're not in that stage. We're really in a stage of what is out there, what do these data tell us, and then we'll make an evaluation working with our working group to come up with the best uh, solution. So for us, our next step is to summarize this performance like we're doing, uh, making sure that we're focusing on Florida-specific projects, uh, making a stab at what the cost will be in the future, uh, what the physical requirements, by that we mean uh, the land area, uh, the power requirements, uh, the, the general operational requirements to, to, for a day-to-day -day operation of a facility like this, and what are the administrative requirements, what are the permitting and uh, re uh, management uh, needs. So given the amount of waste residuals, sludge that we're going to generate with some of these technologies conceptually, that's a big part of it, how to handle those, uh, what are the regulations and how to handle that material. So thanks for that. I'm going to turn it over to Chris. He'll speak on the wetlands treatment side. Okay. Good afternoon again. So I'm going to talk about uh, natural treatment systems are also, also typically uh, characterized as being wetland treatment systems. Uh, there have been a lot of applications of this type of technology in South Florida in particular, so we'll be highlighting some of those projects. Um, but one of, the thing, one of the reasons why this makes it uh, into the list of technologies to look at is because all those same processes that Jim talked about, the biological, the physical, the chemical processes that can occur in these various tanks and compartments and reactors occur quite nicely already in the natural world. And they do so particularly well inside what we call natural treatment systems or treatment wetlands. A few of those processes are shown here, just to kind of draw the parallels between these technologies and the ones that Jim spoke about. Um, sedimentation, water moves very slowly through a natural treatment system typically. So any particulate matter that's coming in off the canal, for example, has an opportunity to physically settle out in the wetland area uh, as that water is moving through from inlet to outlet. Another thing that occurs quite nicely in there is that all the vegetation that you see in this picture and in the and in real wetlands are covered with a, a slimy substance called a biofilm which is really a, a collection of microorganisms that grow attached to the entire bottom of the wetland sediment surface as well as to all the leaf litter the stems and various parts of plants and surfaces that are within the wetland so there is a massive microbial population there that is also kind of sticky and as particles come through they can get trapped on that material and don't make it out the other end. Those same microorganisms provide some of the other biological processes that Jim already spoke about where, and we'll, I'll show you this uh, in a very small amount of detail in the next couple slides, uh, where they can transform the nitrogen and phosphorus and other chemicals that come through the system, use some of those chemicals as food sources for their own survival and transform them into other forms that are less detrimental to the environment. This is a kind of a, a, a schematic of the wetland nitrogen cycle that occurs. As Jim mentioned, nitrogen is one of the key parameters of concern in this watershed, as it is in, in many watersheds. And while this is quite complicated here, the very uh, the take-home message is that in whatever form that nitrogen enters the wetland treatment system. There are mechanisms and processes in there that can convert nitrogen from one form to another. And the ultimate goal is to drive nitrogen from the form that it comes in all the way through the nitrogen cycle, through each of the various steps, convert that into nitrogen gas, and allow that gas to diffuse back out of the water column into the atmosphere and go away. So there's a net removal of nitrogen mass from the water to the atmosphere. The phosphorus cycle is different. We don't have that gaseous uh, transfer from the water column to the atmosphere to take advantage of with the phosphorus cycle. So where the phosphorus ultimately goes in natural treatment systems is into the vegetation. That vegetation then dies and decomposes on a seasonal basis and gets shredded down by the other organisms that live in the, in the wetland and gets turned into new organic soils. So phosphorus, the net sink for phosphorus in these types of systems is burial as new sediments. There are a wide range of uh, treatment wetland types out there. We'll talk about a few of them uh, this afternoon here, but they're generally broken down into categories based on the type of plant community that is dominant within each of those projects. 
some examples here, the most common examples. Uh, on your top left, the floating aquatic vegetation. Um, the next on your top right is the emergent vegetation. That's characteristic of a lot of the stormwater treatment areas that the Water Management District has already constructed throughout South Florida. We'll talk a little bit about those more in a moment. Uh, the submerged aquatic vegetation is, a, is a, a type of plant that grows rooted in most cases, sometimes kind of free floating, uh, but fills the water column without necessarily sticking through the top of the water column like the plants that you see up here in the top right with the emergent systems. And then finally, another kind of broad grouping of natural uh, wetland plant communities is what we call paraphyte. And these are actually algae. They're an attached algae that grow across the substrate or the sediment of uh, typically low nutrient uh, wetland environments and also grow attached as uh, collars on, on emergent vegetation and actually in the submerged aquatic vegetation picture here you can kind of see the same coloration there. They grow attached to the leaf surfaces of submerged aquatic vegetation too. And these each have unique uh, abilities when it comes to water quality improvement. Um, Jim talked about a lot of the engineering and, and, and science and design and everything that goes along behind uh, these conventional systems. And there's no shortage of that when it comes to natural treatment systems either. Uh, there is a wealth of information out there in the literature from studies here in South Florida and studies across the globe uh, that have allowed the practitioners that, that design and implement these systems to really get a very thorough understanding of how they work, why they work, what temperature changes do to them, what different changes in flows do. So it, it's almost as much of an engineered system as any of the technologies that Jim spoke about, uh, but as he also said, they take up a larger land area and they look quite different. I'm going to step now through some of the local examples and show you where natural treatment systems projects have been implemented in South Florida and particularly in the, in the Caloosahatchee Basin and uh, give a little bit of data that we've, that we've reviewed so far to show you how these things might work and how they kind of fit into uh, the issue of the C-43 um, storage reservoir. This slide is showing the five-acre test res reservoir cells that were constructed uh, in the first part of the 2000s. And they were, they were preliminary, or primarily, not preliminarily, primarily constructed to evaluate two different ways of controlling seepage out of the reservoir uh, through the sidewalls. So one was lined with, a, with a, a cement concrete type surface, the other was not. And, the, and they were implemented to really provide guidance for, for Sean's crew to really figure out what the ultimate reservoir construction needed to look like. But at the same time, the district took the opportunity to go ahead and evaluate water quality within those two five acre cells over a period of one year. And these slides are summarizing the various nitrogen fractions and phosphorus uh, data there that were collected over that one year period. And what we saw there is that although we were pumping water in uh, off the canal system adjacent to that site, there was a net reduction in both total nitrogen and total phosphorus in those reservoir cells, which suggests that the same thing could be expected to some degree under uh, similar conditions in the full scale reservoir. So that's encouraging. Um, a more recent study was just completed last summer in July, and this was the, the C43, Let's see if I can get it all spit out here, water quality treatment and testing project phase one, uh, which was completed in these 12 mesocosm tanks here. Uh, and as I said, that, that wrapped up uh, this past July. And there were several objectives to that study. Uh, as most people in this room probably already know, the district has a, a really uh, lengthy and significant experience uh, constructing natural treatment systems to deal with phosphorus to protect the Everglades or the Everglades National Park and the water conservation areas downstream of the Everglades agricultural area but less work had been done on nitrogen and really focusing on what was important relative to controlling nitrogen concentrations and loads so this mesocosm project was a step in the direction of trying to really uh, focus on that issue and try to determine do plant community types make a difference with respect to nitrogen removal? Do the types of soils that these, site, that these systems are constructed on make a difference? And 
how how hard can we operate these how much water can we push through a given size space and and achieve results that are meaningful so those are the real objectives of the study with a particular focus as i said on nitrogen and dissolved organic nitrogen which is the most abundant form of nitrogen in the c43 basin water and it is also the most difficult to remove so the results these are no longer preliminary i just didn't change the slide, so excuse me for that. The final results are that in these mesocosms, uh, as a whole, for across the 12, there was a 23% reduction in total nitrogen concentration, uh, which when you do water balances and account for water gains and losses, resulted in a 33% mass reduction. So concentrations reduced by 23%, load by 33%. As I said, the dissolved organic nitrogen made up most of the nitrogen in the source water. And what we found there was that there was substantially better performance in the wet season than there was in the dry season. 14% reduction in the dissolved organic nitrogen in the wet season versus 4% in the dry. One thing that was uh, especially important to, uh, an especially important finding was that some of that very challenging dissolved organic nitrogen some bioassay bio work that the district completed showed that some portion of that, a small fraction of that, was actually made to be biologically available and then was reduced going through the nitrogen cycle that I showed you in the previous slide and was removed from the system. So that was, that was a, a really excellent finding. The dissolved inorganic nitrogen, that's not something we spent any time on on the, uh, on the nitrogen cycle slide, but those are the forms that are very easy to remove in natural treatment systems. Ammonia, nitrate, those types of nitrogen forms, very easily removed by the microbial populations in natural treatment systems. That material is removed better than 90% in the mesocosm study. Um, one of the key questions we mentioned was that, is there a difference in the plant communities? We had two plant community types that we studied. One was the emergent and one was the submerged aquatic vegetation following on the work that the district had done with respect to phosphorus removal. And what we didn't find was that there was a significant difference in removal between those two plant communities for nitrogen. What we did find was that phosphorus removal was much better in the submerged aquatic vegetation systems, which is uh, the same finding that, that kind of translates throughout the rest of the district's work in South Florida. The SAV systems have some unique processes and characteristics and conditions that allow better phosphorus removal than a comparably sized emergent marsh. So if we drill into the, the, the district's STA data a little bit, while they were not designed or necessarily operated with respect to maximizing uh, nitrogen removal or minimizing nitrogen outflow concentrations, they have collected data uh, and those are useful to look at here. What's really critical to understand is the differences between the EAA basin water and the C43 basin water. And you can see that here in terms of the inflow concentrations. Almost without exception, the inflows in the EAA are higher in organic nitrogen concentrations and total nitrogen concentrations than the water in the Caloosahatchee basin. So there's a different starting point depending on where you are geographically. A lot of that is attributed to the types of soils that are there. And I mentioned that was one of the things that we evaluated in the mesocosm study, and this is why. The organic soils, the peat soils that are throughout the EAA, store naturally much more organic nitrogen in them than sandier or more calcareous soils. So it, it's kind of a, a natural thing there that the no, nitrogen concentrations are higher in that watershed. Even so, there's respectable reductions in nitrogen concentrations in, in the EAAs there. When we look at those for phosphorus, uh, we, see, we see much better results as that was the primary mission of those projects was to really remove phosphorus. And they also all have in them initial emergent vegetation cells to do the initial polishing and reduction of phosphorus followed by the submerged aquatic vegetation system which I mentioned a minute ago does a really exceptional job at reducing phosphorus concentrations. So this is kind of the range of, of uh, concentrations there. And these inflow concentrations are similar. They're slightly higher, but in the general range of, this, of concentrations seen in the Caloosahatchee Basin as well. If we look a little bit more locally, uh, there, there are a 
pretty substantial number of projects at this point in time that have been completed by Lee County, by Lehigh, uh, Sanibel, you know, all, all the working group members here, I think probably each have their own uh, natural treatment system project by this point. Just a few of them are summarized here. And what's important um, in looking at these projects is that these are very basin specific. These are right here in this watershed in the Caloosahatchee Basin. And these are probably the, the best examples to look at of projects as we consider the, the feasibility of a natural treatment system for dealing with the reservoir inflows and outflows. So I won't go through all this detail here necessarily, but you see with respect to, or in comparison to the Everglades agricultural area, that the total nitrogen concentrations coming in are much lower. It's a lot easier to remove stuff when you're starting up here than it is when you're starting down here with the way these processes work. So that drives the need for maybe larger areas than you might need in other places. Uh, you need different processes to some degree, uh, but it all works into the design calculations. The encouraging thing is that there's, you know, ranging from about a six to 40% or so reduction in total nitrogen for each of these projects. Uh, and, and really pretty good removal in total phosphorus concentrations as well. Uh, the Lakes Park system here is, it has a little asterisk on it and you see that it's got some of the lower numbers, but the thing to focus on there is, is really how low that inflow nitrogen concentration was of uh, 0.66 milligrams per liter. There's not a whole lot you can do with that, um, whether you're talking about a natural treatment system or even a conventional unit process type system to reduce that type of concentration short of going to reverse osmosis. Um, but even so, in, and it's also asterisk because that, those are wet season numbers there. Dry season for that system didn't show nearly uh, as good a reduction. Uh, but, you know, a, a positive change there during wet season conditions at very low inflow concentrations. Um, some other types of projects that kind of fit in this box of natural treatment systems are ponds and lakes. We've already talked about kind of the, the, the test cell study at the reservoir site and what that was able to accomplish. Um, Lee County uh, had some consultants study a handful of wet detention systems. These are your, your typical stormwater basins in neighborhoods and subdivisions, uh, you know, shopping centers and those things. So the results from, th from three of those are summarized here. And again, it's similar water, uh, maybe slightly higher concentrations because it's getting a little bit more locally specific runoff coming in off parking lots and other paved surfaces that maybe have some additional nutrient concentration in them. Um, but positive changes, um, you know, 26 to 50% reductions in total nitrogen concentrations there. And then finally, uh, the floating treatment wetlands. We've got more work to do um, looking at these and looking for more case studies and, and, and examples. There's, you know, there's a, a fair amount of literature out there for these, there's not as many Florida specific studies and uh, even fewer Caloosahatchee Basin studies, but we did find a few and, and some of those results are highlighted here. Um, typically these systems are put in and they're very small in footprint relative to the size of the water body in which they're placed. So it is sometimes very challenging to um, come to strong conclusions about the benefits that they had on water quality improvement, how much nitrogen or phosphorus was reduced in the water sitting underneath them or flowing past them. Most of these are placed in ponds and the pond water is studied, but they're not really flow through systems in the way that the reservoir pre or post treatment system is going to be to where you can really look at the ins and outs and understand, did it make a net improvement or not? Uh, so it's a little difficult to, to interpret all those data. But some other interesting things have come out uh, that are out there in the literature from local projects. And one is that there's a possible allelopathic interaction between plant roots and algae. What that basically means in, in layman's terms is there's something coming out of the roots of those plants that the algae don't like. And it interferes with their ability to metabolize and grow, replicate, and somehow helps to control their population. It's not very well understood, uh, but it's, it's something that's out there and we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into. The other thing that these do, and this one is, is a little bit more of an obvious conclusion, is that they shade the water column. While they also take nutrients up directly into their roots and, and accumulate that in their biomass, you've got a floating mat of vegetation that is shading some portion of the water column. And algae need two things. 
they need nutrients and they need light. So if you can cut off one or other of those or both in the case of these systems, you have some ability to help control their populations. It's all yours. It's all yours. All right. Thank you to our presenters. Um, Marcy Frick with Tetra Tech and Lisa Canty with te uh, Tetra Tech are both going to come to the end of the aisles and you should have gotten some index cards as you came in and there's some additional ones in the back. Uh, this is the time to hand out, uh, hand your questions to them and they'll bring them up to the consultant and working group for answering those questions after I go over a, a few of the, the next steps. Future public meetings, uh, March 25th and July 16th are our next public meetings. The March 25th meeting is a night meeting. Um, that meeting, the goal of the meeting will be to provide, oops, sorry about that, will be uh, to provide you information on the final information collection summary report and then to take your comment on the preliminary draft feasibility study. So we'll be moving from the, the literature collection to the actual study. The July 16th uh, meeting, the goal will be to uh, present the findings that the, from the evaluations the consultants have done up to that date and to take your public comment on the draft feasibility study. Um, also in that, that March meeting, the consultant group, they'll have been working on evaluations and they'll start moving from 25 to 10 conceptual alternatives for consideration. And then in the July 16th meeting, we'll be looking at moving from those 10 conceptual alternatives, looking towards uh, the three conceptual alternatives for um, future development. You've heard about our project deliverables, the data collection uh, information summary report, our literature review. Um, there's a summary of it. It's going to be on the website, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, it's due uh, in middle to end of March. It will be, as I said, uh, ready and available prior to our March 25th public meeting. The feasibility study itself will be uh, completed the mid to late October and the presentations will be in uh, November of this year. This website on the bottom of this slide is what I've been referring to as the working group website. It's also on the bottom of your agenda. We created that for you because I know you got a lot of information during this meeting. Uh, so you can go to that website and you can see these next public meetings I just announced, the time, date, and location. Uh, you can see the video as well as the meeting minutes and present, uh, PowerPoint presentations that we've done in these meetings. Also on that, that website, it's a, a wealth of information. Um, it has the um, executive order that uh, Ed Smith had mentioned earlier, the C43 uh, reservoir fact sheet, uh, more information that Sean had talked about. Uh, it's got a link to the DEP technology library that you've heard about, uh, that uh, several of our speakers talked about, as well as a link to all of the studies that JTEC has collected to date. So I encourage you with the um, information collection summary report being complete mid-March, take a look at that information. If we're missing any, any really good local studies, uh, data, you know, innovative technologies, there is a email uh, in the middle here, you'll see the C43 water quality at southsfwmd.gov. That is the email you can submit any technologies, uh, any studies, data that you feel are pertinent on that email site. It'll come to Georgia and myself and we'll be, we'll ensure that the team uh, reviews that information. 
Um, our website also contains the work plan, which is the you know, roadmap for our study. So you can see the process that we're going through. It has all of the consultants as well as our working groups, uh, names, telephone numbers, and email addresses if you uh, want to reach out to, to any of them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for Q&A. Uh, to Georgia and uh, we'll take your questions. All right, I'm going to try and read some read everyone's handwriting here and um, I think I'll start with um, uh, let's see this one is is there or will there be any preference for natural system solutions such as constructed wetlands and I think you're getting at preference over pre pre preference of natural wetland treatments systems over treatment technology, uh, the chemical or physical treatment technologies, and I will look to Jim, do you want to take that one? All right, <clears throat> so the question is, uh, is there a preference for natural systems over conventional systems, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, uh, at this point, there is certainly not that preference. At this point, we're technology neutral. Uh, we really have a div division of labor here based upon our respective histories and our assignments here. but. Uh, it's all on the table as far as we're concerned. Uh, there will be natural constraints to implementing different technologies. Uh, if our analysis indicates that we need a really large wetland beyond what may be available, then that might be uh, discouraging for a natural system approach. It may be also that a conventional system generates just a heck of a lot of residuals that have to be managed, and that turns into a big burden. That would be a negative on the conventional side. So the idea is that we don't know those answers yet. We're simply combining, collecting information. So we'll make that assessment both in a ranking, both in terms of its cost effectiveness or the uh, amount of residuals, for example, power needed, things like that, that will rank these technologies and will, uh, that, that division of, uh, that separation of natural versus conventional will probably be in, embedded in that uh, matrix somewhere based on how well they do for different, uh, how they well they meet these criteria. Oh, okay. But Chris, would you agree with that? Or do you anything to say, add to no. that? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I didn't think so. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'll, I'll okay. add that they, yeah. they typically compare favorably mm -hmm. with more energy intensive technologies. But as Jim said, we'll have to lay out the methodology and, and treat everything fairly and go through the process and see ultimately where they fall mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. 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 <clears throat> Maya reminds us that, um, that some technologies are actually combinations. You know, a wetland could be combined with a chemical treatment system. And this has been shown and very effective for space efficiencies. Um, or some combination of aeration and storage it provides other opportunities for treatment. So we don't want to miss out on that, op that blend, but, but that's certainly very possible here, that we'll get a combination. So the next question, Jim, don't go anywhere, is um, is there any consideration given to prioritize or limit options to those that do not introduce new substances that can alter the aquatic environment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got that. Some of these uh, might do that. Some of these might be the addition of a microbial consortium to provide this treatment, or they might be we're adding chemicals to provide the treatments, and that is something that is just inherent to that process, that technology. Uh, right now, I would say there's not a bias against that necessarily. It's just it, it, it turns into a question that's raised along the way. Is that is that a permissible uh, approach? Is that uh, does that work at the scale? Uh, what might be good for a golf course pond may not be appropriate for a 10,000 acre reservoir, for example. Things like that. So I'd say at this point, you can tell we're, we're, we're keeping it very neutral in how we assess these things. The key is to identify what matters to you, and that's really the kind of input here that I think we really hope to get out of this meeting, if that's an important consideration. 
Okay. Uh, the next question is, are O&M costs considered in prioritizing selecting treatment technologies? And one of the things we didn't really focus on because it's part of the next phase of the study is a cost-benefit analysis that's going to be performed on, on the technologies to ensure that um, not only the construction but the operation of the technology is, is of a benefit and not a burden to the, the overall budget of the entities. So the, uh, <clears throat> so the operations and maintenance uh, requirements are really critical to understand. This facility would operate conceivably as far as we can imagine into the future, right? It's always going to be taking water from the river and always discharging it back during the dry season. It will work every year like that. So we've got to make sure that any process that's treating water is something that can be sustained over a long period, decades, you know. So, the idea here is that if we can uh, determine, identify what the operational and maintenance requirements are and what those annual costs are, that can be folded into a long-term uh, present value analysis to figure out what that costs and if that's the best approach for that approach, for that technology. Um, uh, did I get all that? Yeah. Something goes yeah. too far me. Um, I hope I answered the question, whoever asked that. Uh, I think that's, but that's the idea. We're trying to look at the long term too we'll, in, in the final analysis. Okay. I wanted to hand you those to see if you want to ask questions. Did you want to address any, either of those? Sure. I, I have the easiest presentation and I have the hardest question. <laughs> How does that work? Uh, so you come over to it works well for right. us. So the first question was, uh, what role might ASR, aquifer storage and recovery wells, play in C43 water quality? Um, so uh, separate from the reservoir itself, so the reservoir is intended obviously to be a big storage um, metering, uh, you know, toolbox in the district's um, tool belt to manage that salinity barrier. Um, for water quality, ASRs, you know, would take water in, um, in uh, high discharge periods out of the river, presumably, and pump them into the ground. And then at some point, there needs to be a technology to take it back out of the ground and deliver it to where a presumably better quality water would be distributed. So I think it's just on a list of things that we'll evaluate in this particular study. The second question was, without considering current hydraulic limitations, what would be needed to allow C43 outflow allocation for enhancement of the nearby Orange River? Well, um, if you don't consider hydraulic limitations, there's, <laughs> there's no way to get water over to the uh, Orange River. But I think what the uh, commenter is asking is, how can I get, how can I move water from a discharge point at the reservoir um, five or 10 miles further west to help uh, Orange River. And I'm aware of some projects that the Lehigh Acres Improvement District is currently working on to, um, to essentially treat um, some of the stormwater discharges through their system of ponds for discharge back into the various tributaries that make their way back into the C43. To get water, so one of our constraints is I can't put a pipe in the C43 reservoir. So that project's already been authorized and, appro and approved as is. So we would have to come up with another hydraulic way of conveying discharges out of the reservoir once they're out of the reservoir into the Townsend Canal and then somehow over to um, over to the Orange River. Does that kind of answer the question? And then the last one was with uh, regarding the water quality monitoring uh, would include uh, HAB uh, microcystin uh, type uh, studies or, or monitoring in the reservoir and discharge that would be part of the uh, operations plan that's currently being developed for the project.
So I just wanted to add, amplify on one thing. Right now, we, as I think you were saying, we, did, we haven't really factored in ASR as a technology for water quality improvement yet. You know, it's a, it, we're looking at these uh, more or less uh, unit process kind of treatment mechanisms, but ASR does have some uh, features that are attractive in terms of water quality impacts. Uh, so uh, we'll give that some more thought, I think, is fair to say at this point. Okay, thank you. This question says, what nutrient reduction goals will the various technologies be evaluated against to determine the most effective suite of options? Uh, discharge limit, QBEL, not causing or contributing to violations of water quality standards. Thank you for answering your own question. Uh, <laughs> at, no, th there, there is not a defined, uh, and this, this is kind of on the next one too, there's not a, a specific treatment target for the reservoir in terms of pre within or post treatment other than <clears throat> compared to water that would otherwise discharge downstream in the c43 the reservoir discharge will not make that worse it needs to be the same or better water quality so there is in the next step the next phase of this project we will be developing um kind of the the data based hypothetical cases of what is that reservoir inflow water quality data set likely to look like what is water quality within the reservoir likely to look like and what is the water quality released from the reservoir going to look like from that we will be able to then compare these different alternatives and size them so that um, they are not causing or contributing they are at least making uh, putting out the same quality water as otherwise would have been discharged directly down the river in the absence of the reservoir project. That work, that step will be presented at a subsequent meeting for additional comment and input from folks. Another one? I already have one. Um, any, recon any consideration of how much sediment legacy nutrients will play in the nutrient budget? Um, <laughs> you want this one? You're in the reservoir. Um, th that'll certainly be something that has to be looked at. In, in, as I just said a second ago, in looking at that kind of that hypothetical test case of we have, nobody's built this reservoir yet. It hasn't operated for six months, one year, 10 years, 20 years. So there's going to be some work that will be done to kind of bracket the range of possibilities of what that water quality is going to look like and, and to what degree the sediment load from natural settling that would occur or from any of these technologies that might, be, might possibly be implemented on the way into or within the reservoir and how those may also contribute sediment loads, how that ultimately affects the whole system. So uh, we haven't considered it in any detail yet, but it will have to be done in this next step as we go into the evaluation of alternatives. Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership held the C43 Reservoir Water Quality Summit on June 5th. Several concepts and specific projects were discussed, including the importance of treating both total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Off-site options such as the GS10 project, which is in the Lehigh Improvement District. Uh, present, etc. The presentations and public input gathered can be viewed on the CHNEP's website. Has this been reviewed by the technical team and do they plan to do so? Do so. Some of that has been reviewed. Um, the GS10 project is one that's mentioned here specifically. It's my understanding that I don't believe that project's completed yet. So I don't think that there are data from that to use to say it removed this much nitrogen and this much phosphorus. But uh, as you've seen with the examples that we did put up, we have many more than were shown today uh, from, you know, Lee County, Sanibel, Lehigh, all these, uh, you know, um, working group member uh, governments here. Those will all be evaluated uh, and, and, and summarized in the report. So um, anything that was referenced in the summit uh, that has reported data somewhere um, will be looked at and included. Uh, there's also an additional comment here about uh, has the tech team reviewed all 
I'm going to say no right now to all. Uh, the DEP statewide stormwater rule studies that quantify nutrient removal efficiencies of different treatment technologies. I'm sure there's some overlap with, with the technologies that Jim has looked at on, on his side. Uh, our focus so far on the natural treatment systems has been uh, more on the, these regionally specific projects. A lot of those reports that we have reviewed are written up um, as a contractual obligation for grant funding, so they're done in a very similar way as a lot of the projects that went into, that the DEP has reviewed in development of the statewide stormer, storm water rule a few years back. Um, so there's, there's likely some overlap there as well, but we will uh, make sure to dive a little deeper and make sure nothing escapes from that data set that, that is meaningful here. Thanks. I just wanted to respond back to the earlier question about the sediment legacy. That was a very insightful question there because these reservoirs will accumulate nitrogen and phosphorus over time. Every Florida lake or reservoir does that. That's what sediments are really is that historic legacy. I think in our case, uh, what, we, what I want to do with this is turn this into a criteria. Is the technology suitably flexible enough to be able to account for changes in concentrations coming out of the lake if it's related to release from the sediments? So, uh, that, that's probably easy for, easier for some technologies than others. Uh, normally we size for a certain flow or a certain load. If it exceeds that for some reason, is there enough capacity to provide the treatment? So I think we'll use this as a criterion. Um, the next question is, has the project received an FDEP water quality certification and an NPDES permit? The, the reservoir itself has received a construction permit uh, to build, obviously, the, the levees, the pump station, and all those um, features of the reservoir project. They also have an NPDES construction permit for having a construction project larger than one acre and, you know, all the um, best management practices associated with erosion control for the construction. Um, the operation, it's, it's currently only authorized for storage. The operation uh, permit will be issued separately, and that will also include a water quality certification. Um, and then the other question I think is mixing two things, but I'll try and address it. It says, will offsite treatment projects be considered toward the reservoir meeting the water quality based effluent limitations? And so the water quality based effluent limitations, the QBEL is um, not going to be applicable necessarily to this reservoir that's for um, STAs and associated with the EAA agricultural area. So um, the off-site treatment projects will be considered toward help meeting the, um, the BMAP, the improvements required for the, the uh, watershed. I think I got that right. Did I do good? Okay. <laughs> All right. That, I think that was it as far as our questions. And you had... Did you have any input on that? No, that's good too. All right. Well, this isn't really within the parameter of this study. Uh, the question was, are there any plans for a reservoir north of Laco to slow and clean water before it reaches the lake? Um, we have a Lake Okeechobee um, watershed restoration plan uh, project that, that's ongoing, and the PIR is under development. And we have more information on that on the Water Management District website. I, I don't know if we have anybody in the audience who um, is, is more familiar with that project who uh, can possibly talk to the individual who asked this question. Um, but the information is on our website. I'm sorry, I can't answer more. It's not in the parameter of our study. The other question on is, would it be more cost effective to store and clean water closer to the source of major water uh, inlets in the Kissimmee River rather than, than at the end at the Caloosahatchee. And I think the answer to that question is, as Ed Smith had noted earlier, um, DEP, there, you know, between the DEP and the district, there's a suite of projects that are, that are going on to address water quality issues from, from the headwaters, you know, down to the Caloosahatchee. And so, uh, you know, those projects are, are ongoing and, and so noted uh, that, yes, it's always good to treat the source if you can. Yeah. Just 
just also to clarify, um, as James point reminded me, the C43 reservoir isn't just for storing Lake O water, but it's also a, a huge portion of the base and local base and runoff. So if you if you didn't put it there, you would miss that capture of, of stormwater runoff if you only stored north of the lake. So I think I think the idea is there has to be storage north, south, east, and west of the lake. So that's that was the envision of SERP, and uh, that's that's why we're doing this project here today. Any other questions? Uh, no more questions, Marcy, Lisa? All right, we've got 25 minutes, and so the consultant team and the working group and, and uh, several DEP district staff are in the audience. If you want to stay, we'll be here until 4 o'clock so that you can have some one-on-one -on -one, uh, FaceTime with the team. Thanks to all the presenters, and thank to all of, all of you for uh, coming out today.